Hello, Alex Downham here, and today I'm going to do a overview of one of my more recent projects I've been working on the past 12 weeks, and basically go over all the processes um, that are used to build the Gothic Cathedral environment. To begin with, I'm going to start off in Maya and show all the assets that I ended up making for this environment and just go over some of the techniques, workflows, sort of organization methods I used just to help with keeping track on the uh, keeping track with the project. So right, right here you see all the final assets that were pulled, put into engine um, in this uh, viewport and I've got this assigned to uh, a layer and this is something I really like to use is making use of Maya's layer feature as when it comes to baking uh, I like to keep them separate so I know what I'm dealing with. I also in the outline I keep my final assets and high poly separated so I know I can find them and I keep them in a group. The other thing I always do is I, don't, I always keep a backup of the high poly mesh in its non-converted form so for whatever reason I need to make changes to the base bake I can I still have access to the non-converted mesh and I can make changes to the edge flow or add in support more supporting edges and such and yeah so I've kind of covered some of the workflows I used in my blog but I'll quickly to go over uh, how I made most of the assets. So coming out of um, the block out, so this is really early on, 11 weeks ago or so, uh, I've got very basic uh, crude meshes that I use to block out the environment. I only really spent a bit of time with some of the details. Obviously this pillar structure is quite complicated. So I did spend a, a little bit of time um, sort of adding in some of those unique features and this actually helped quite a bit because after the block out stage I had something to work with, I didn't have a blank canvas and I could kind of rework these meshes and that's kind of what I did for the most part so for example this pillar came from the block out I then reworked it into something more final and uh, this was the result so we've got quite a nice smooth high poly mesh. Really, I've made sure the topology is really clean. And I spent quite a bit of time with this mesh in particular. So I'd create a high poly mesh. Then I would retopologize that. So this is the retopologized lower, lower polygon mesh. Quite high poly. I mean, I wasn't going for optimizations per se, but it works and obviously I'd convert that to the really dense high poly so this is sitting at 200,000 faces as you can see they're all triangles and then I would bake the two so if we turn the final and high poly on you can see I've kept them quite close to each other and this is so um, if I do need to rebake I know that the, the cage or the low poly is already sitting on the high poly mesh and I can just quickly go into transfer maps and then just add the two meshes and then rebake it out and that's just a thing to save time so I'm not messing around trying to find where things are at and for the most part this is pretty much the process I used and I would you know build mesh by mesh and bake it out where where it was necessary and go from there so once the mesh had been baked out, um, I then made sure it was all centered to the grid and then export each one, one by one, out to a meshes folder. And that would eventually be put into Unreal 4. So that kind of covers, I'm not going to go into how I modeled each mesh, but that's kind of very um, general overview of how I used um, Maya to make each mesh. Obviously 
depended sometimes it depended on the the mesh whether it needed a high poly detail mesh for example this candle I made in about five minutes um, because it's such a minor prop didn't really spend a whole load of time on it and other things like the holly wreath uses another you know technique as well to create leaves I made a leaf card and then duplicated that around and again it's like another workflow that's relevant depending on the mesh so um, next I'm going to cover um, some of the more texturing processes I used and I'll move into Substance Designer right so we're back and we're now we're in Substance Designer and for this project I really wanted to explore um, Substance Designer in more detail and look at some of the features that you can use to expose parameters and then have those accessible in engine so so I kind of wanted to, that was one aspect I wanted to look at but the other one is I wanted to look at more procedurally based uh, material generation and to do that I started looking at um, you know using noises to generate textures rather than using um, bitmaps so for example this uh, material we see here is a stone material I used a lot for a lot of the structural elements of the cathedral and while it's probably, I look at it now and it's probably not the best um, I'm still learning new things about how you can mess around with the noise nodes and to get different results but for the most part this was uh, what I ended up with so I was aiming for kind of a um, a masonry sort of look and I'll go over some of the things I did so over here I'm pushing some very basic noise nodes and then mixing them together to get uh, a, a start for some texturing and then we're pulling in more noise and more noise just layering it up and then here I'm adding like a, I wanted to try and get that carved or where the chisel's been going across the stone uh, sort of look and then I pull in some cracks so, so we can age there's a you can actually control the levels and add more or less cracks and this mask controls that and that was the base albedo and then for the normal I kind of cheated a bit <laughs> and just used whatever I felt looked good for the normal map um, and then the roughness was also sort of derived a bit randomly again this is still something I'm learning how to do better I would say I've learnt quite a bit um, regarding how not to do it <laughs> and maybe this is probably not the best way of doing it but it worked for the scope of this project I was working on um, one thing I did really want to explore is exposing parameters uh, that would be available in the material so this is actually a template I used um, so here we can see I have some parameters exposed and so we can for example add more cracks in I mentioned earlier and that controls a levels node I have set up to add in more cracks across the surface so we can age it or we can make it more clean and then there's this damage node that controls a normal effect that I have here that adds in more or less damage to the surface normal that's a normal effect and we also have other things that you can change the color of the base material however I noticed this can lead to some problems when you change it and then it kind of looks off especially if you're not using proper albedo values as I'm not really using here per se it's kind of just eyeballed it to how I wanted it to look and uh, then we can also tweak the roughness so we can make it less or more rough depending on the desired result and yeah that was kind of so I was kind of wanted to more look at it, exposing parameters and seeing how far I could take it and having those also accessible in Unreal 4 eventually and so that was some of the material stuff I did in Substance 
Um, but the next thing I wanted to look at was actually also using a template that I could reuse on all my assets. So one thing I've noticed from a previous projects using Substance Designer was I was often at times reusing the same effects over and over again and it was really monotonous to have to re-copy and paste those effects when I just wanted the same thing. So I thought, well I've heard about these templates, let's try and work this out. And it was fairly straightforward. Um, for those of you who don't know, you can literally just add in a input node, which is somewhere here. And for some reason I can't see it. There's an output. Ah, there we go, color image input or grayscale image input. So we can s define this and in the parameters here we can define like a name for it. So for example, this input here, I've got a normal input and this, this normal input then is plugged into various effects and control certain aspects of the template which will then eventually output the four maps. I've also got an AO input here, no, somewhere, here, this is the AO input, and we've also got an SVG input to control the multi-material blend, um, I'm not sh this is kind of not the best way, um, I'm not sure if there's a better way, but I had to manually go one by one and create inputs for each base material, <coughs> excuse me, to have access to the uh, multi-material blend uh, inputs. I'm not sure if there's a way to perhaps expose these parameters and have them accessible in the greater template. So I'll show you how this template was used. So I could pull this, uh, can then create another graph. Um, for example, we'll look at the pillar. Now I've or obviously organized it as best as possible. So I've got a resources folder that contains all the props or assets and then any relevant maps for each asset. So for this template I ended up only using two inputs, two main inputs. We've got the AO map um, and the normal map. And these two inputs then output our albedo, normal, roughness, uh, metallic if necessary. And in this template I also exposed uh, some more parameters that we actually have at the root of the uh, uh, graph and these allowed me to tweak the effects I mentioned in the effects template so by having these two inputs I then have those uh, then have access to control those effects uh, so for example the AO map controls a grunge effect a very basic grunge effect where I use the inverted AO to define as a mask to define where the dirt should build up so we've got this dirt amount slider so if I increase that to the maximum you can see that dirt level gets quite a lot more um, def uh, predominant on the mesh whereas if we take that down to zero get a nice clean looking pillar and I didn't go mad with these effects as I was still learning how this could be applied but obviously you could ob go you know a lot f deeper in terms of using perhaps even some of the preset uh, mask generators within Substance Designer and then have those available and just tweak them on the fly. Uh, so these parameters uh, were exposed in sub uh, were exposed so they were available in Unreal 4 and I could if I wanted to then tweak those in real time with an engine which I will show later. So the great thing about this template was if I wanted to make changes to how the assets were to be textured I could literally go into our effects template, asset effects template and make changes. Now because this graph is referenced within each of these graphs for each asset those changes would then be propagated to all these assets. So it would, this meant I could save a ton of time one, not only with texturing, but two, uh, with making changes to a, a large amount of assets. And really that was something I really wanted, another aim I was kind of focusing on 
was not only being procedural but being able to iterate quickly, save time and minimize the amount of time spent saving things out and importing and exporting where necessary. And this template was quite versatile, it could do a variety of materials. For example, we've got um, a wooden pew I can show. Um, and then in this case, I didn't use a uh, procedural texture, I ended up using some bitmaps, which obviously will increase the size of the published file. However, um, for the sake of this project, I wasn't too worried about optimizations as it's for a cinematic or visual visual um, visualization. So obviously we can plug in whatever material we want, plug in the AO and normal inputs, and then we get the four map outputs. And for the most part, this is quite a, re a really nice simple process to use, and really didn't take that long at all. I could just create a new graph, pull in the template, pull in the baked inputs, and tweak some parameters in the template, and there I had it, I had a textured asset. Um, so yeah, for that was kind of the texturing process I used uh, within Substance Designer. So mainly looking a little bit at procedural materials, but mostly focusing on the effects template as an easier way to texture assets, as well as make quick iterations. So I will cover next um, getting everything into Unreal 4. Um, but one last point I'll make with Substance Designer was um, publishing the SB SBRA, I think it's called. I've never remember this. The SBSAR file, and this is the published file that you can then import into the various integrations of Substance Designer. And I will go over how that ended up working within Unreal 4 next. So we will now move to Unreal 4. Right here we are in Unreal Engine and now I'll cover some of the processes I used within Unreal Engine to create the final scene we see here and I will to begin with sort of carry on from the Substance Designer so after I'd published the SBAR file I could then import this using the uh, Substance plugin that's available for Unreal 4 and this allows you to import this Substance Instant Factory and basically this, once you import this, this then allows you uh, access to each graph that you had <coughs> created within Substance and you literally create an instance of this graph and this will produce uh, these five files, so in this case we've got the stone instance from this graph and then this graph then creates the four map outputs now this graph is a necessity because you open this up and now you have access to all the parameters that you may have exposed within Substance Designer. <coughs> so I can go in here and tweak these values and change the texture on the fly. And this is where it's really useful if you do want to uh, make changes once in Engine rather than go back and re-import it. And it was kind of something I looked at a bit for this environment. Maybe not necessarily used it as much, but it's useful to know and it was interesting to try it out. So once I created instances of the factory I then needed some way to organize these a bit better so I created folders for each graph asset and this was just a way of organizing all the textures in a manageable way. Now the next problem comes is you still need a material to apply to each mesh and Substance gives you the option to create a material but I decided to go my own route with material creation so um, I ended up making use of a master material and this mat master material allows me to kind of in a similar way create instances of a main factory and then just be able to drag and drop map inputs into the instance so I've got texture parameters here that will then be accessible in an instance so uh, for example, we can open an instance and see the difference between the two. 
So that's the master material while a uh, instance of that literally just has these check check boxes that you can check and then throw in any textures you want depending on the material you're creating. But then could then again similar to the template within Substance Designer make changes on the fly and then those changes to the master material will then be propagated to all the instances of this material. So this master material is not that complicated. I've got um, a few interesting things going on here. For example, some vertex painting, and that then gets used to um, paint in some extra dirt details. I've also got some other things like tiling the diffuse or texture parameters or in some cases where there is no texture, just using solid color. And that's really about it. So um, I did make use of master material, it's really useful, especially when you have all these texture outputs that you need to plug into materials and they could then just be quickly put in and applied to the mesh. So that was the texture, texturing process pretty much. Um, to get it into engine was a really simple process. I didn't really have to f mess around with individual maps. I just had one file for the most part that I could import. But there were a few exceptions to this where I did have some unique assets that I didn't use Substance Designer and instead I went opted for a more traditional method. So for example I made um, the stained glass that uses uh, just a, a texture that I edited together and did it that way instead. And so, let's talk about the lighting in Unreal. So, for the lighting in this project, I didn't want to bake any of the lighting. And this is for a couple of reasons. The first reason was I didn't want to have to create light maps for each asset. And this saved a lot of time, as spending time trying to create a second UV set um, does take a lot of time and not this and a lot of time you sp you have to wait well so kind of second reason is then you have to wait for the lighting to build and y you oftentimes get errors and then you have to go back and then you forget something and in the end it just becomes a lot of a, a lot of hassle and the other reason was I wanted to be able to iterate on the lighting quickly and again waiting for those build times can take a lot of time and especially when you've got a tight deadline I just needed a quick way to iterate quickly. Now this didn't come without its problems I did encounter uh, a lot of errors especially with what method I was going to choose for lighting so originally I was going to use uh, Unreal 4's light propagation volumes however after using them for a while it was clear they weren't quite uh, a feature complete quite feature complete and didn't really hold up to the um, desired effect I wanted. So I opted to use the cascade lighting and I also used the more newer feature of uh, distance field meshes to not only add AO but also use ray tree soft shadows. So for the most part this works quite well however as you can see there are errors where the distance field AO has not worked and that was an error on my part where the meshes aren't quite built correctly and in this case these vault sections are have no back faces so the volume meshes are generated incorrectly so that's an error on my my part but again it ended up working quite well so the final result of that was then I had a light a lighting setup that I could you know tweak on the fly get different angles and see the final so kind of see what I in the viewport would be the final lighting result this had a couple of drawbacks where for example I don't get nice bounce lighting that you probably would get from using the uh, global illumination uh, light mass baker and to kind of account for that, I used uh, a skylight with a cube map, and this helps illuminate the scene a bit more. 
and get nice reflections on the metals and as well as just add a kind of a fake bounce lighting so to speak not necessarily bounce lighting but just add a little bit extra and then there's a few point lights as well for the for example the candles and another drawback is the frame rate does doesn't quite stand up so obviously in a game environment this probably wouldn't work but again this project was a cinematic as for you know portfolio piece it's it wasn't really meant to be for a game but obviously that's a consideration I personally have to make when working on proper game projects uh, so that's a lighting aspect so I've kind of gone over materials lighting textures so for meshes fairly straightforward um, obviously after modeling a Maya these would then be exported as FBXs I would then import each mesh I wasn't too worried about collision or anything like that uh, then import them make sure they had the right material IDs apply whatever material and then put it in the scene now this scene was created a couple of times um, mainly because I had a few changes to scale that I made we have a look here in the top down view this is quite nice when you see the layout of all the cross faults um, I, I followed um, a reference of a top down schematic of a cathedral I kind of followed that layout of the cathedral so some last things I'll go over we've got some particle effects in here very basic just some dust motes that float around it's actually an old effect from UDK that I had used in the past uh, it's actually E3D's effect and I reapplied it for Unreal 4 really straightforward to do and it adds a lot of uh, depth to the scene especially when you have nice depth of field um, yeah that's pretty much it for this environment it's taken me a good 12 or 11 weeks to complete I would say the structural elements of the environment probably took the longest as they had to be they were modular and so for example the cross vaults or I duplicated one by one and I had to make sure they all fit together and all the meshes worked and that, that took quite a bit of time and obviously then texturing them all it also took time uh, but again thanks to say a substance designer that helped a lot with the iteration and speed of the project